Hello and welcome to today's Fat Tell Daily video. Today I'm joined as always on a Monday by our crypto tech guru, Ryan Dintz. Ryan, welcome, mate. Hey, buddy, how are you? Now you, yeah, I'm good, thank you. And you're talking today, uh, you start your daily musing, your daily insight with an interesting parallel between Sir Isaac Newton's alchemical experiments and modern attempts to replicate Bitcoin. Um, I thought that yeah. was an interesting way of uh, introducing your your thoughts today. Um, I didn't know Sir Isaac Newton tried to do a bit of alchemy in his time. I had no idea about that. Yeah, more than a bit, to be honest. Like everyone, everyone knows uh, the Newtonian laws of physics, the old story of how he was sitting there and an apple fell and he made him ponder the laws of gravity. And you know, look for the. I suppose his his scientific laws formed the basis of the industrial revolution in the modern world in many ways until Albert Einstein came along <laughs> and decided that they were actually not 100% correct, which is, you know, the story of science, really. Uh, but everyone knows about Sir Isaac Newton for that. He, he was put up as sort of an exemplar of science, scientific, you know, um, straightforwardness. And yet on the side, he wrote over a million words on alchemy Um which was like, you know, considered back then as the, the study of the occult and, and the church severely frowned on it. Um, but I, Isaac Newton wasn't alone in it. You know, there was other si well-known scientists of the time, like um, um, Richard Boyle, an Irish scientist, famous guy. Um, they all were looking at um, the chemistry of things. And so what, what we call alchemy back then, we probably call chemistry today. But they didn't know half as much as what we know today about chemistry. So a favorite pastime and a favorite... Um, sort of attempt by the alchemists was to see if they could turn lead into gold uh, and there was all these fables and legends of it there's something called the philosopher's stone which people might know from harry potter these days but the original philosopher's stone was this this uh substance you could create that could turn lead into gold and they thought mercury had something to do with it because you know mercury was this weird metal that turned into liquid and done all sorts of crazy things and um Actually, you know, mercury did make people turn crazy, as they, they later found out. You know, the, the old phrase, as mad as yeah. a hatter, comes from yeah. the fact that the, the hat makers used to use a lot of mercury and <laughs> it made them go crazy over time. Uh, but yeah, the, the story I was getting to, or the analogy I was trying to make today, was Isaac Newton spent a lot of time on the side. I think people didn't know about this for a long time until 200 years after his death, but he spent a lot of time trying to uh, see if he could create gold from lead or create gold from base metals, and he couldn't. And I think that realization or that all that testing led him um, to he he was made he was appointed a master of the royal mint in in 1699, and you know in 1717 he sort of. Uh, um, put the Bank of England onto a gold standard essentially. He made he made gold the fundamental basis of the currency of the British pound. Um and that was very successful for a few hundred years. And I think he did that because he had realized that you couldn't forge gold. You couldn't create it out of nothing. It did its scarcity value was true and it was this independent store of value asset which would make it the good bedrock of a of a currency. Mm -hmm. And Look, I tied that into like what's happened with Bitcoin in the last um, 15 years. You've had all sorts of attempts to attack it, to bring it down, to kill it. You've had a whole lot of other cryptocurrencies try to say that they could create a better Bitcoin, and yet they've not. And I think what maybe happened last year was uh, BlackRock, the famous uh, money manager, sort of looked at all that. They were they were a skeptic for a long time, and, and, and they made this amazing 180 on Bitcoin last year. Mm. Um, and became a big supporter of it. And they, in my opinion, they've sort of had that Newtonian realization that, hang on, this thing can't be killed. It can't be recreated. It does have true scarcity value. It is not something that is going to go away. Maybe there is more to this as as a form of money. And the amazing thing to me is they're going around the world saying that. You know, you, you know I've been saying this for a long yeah. time in our publications, but now you've got the biggest money manager in the world saying that very same thing. And I think they've come to that that realization that there is properties to Bitcoin that make it unique and valuable. And now they're trying to see in what ways can it be integrated into the existing financial system. I've got one question on, and, and maybe it's um, it's a more far reaching question. I'll, I'll get back to the Black Rocks, Black Rocks shift in just a moment. But if gold, many people be wondering if gold has served that function first, uh, for 200 years when it was actually the bedrock of the financial system and un underpinned 
the, the, the financial order of that time. But then for thousands of years prior to that, it might not have been decreed by government or a central bank, but it was the go-to, natural go-to. Um, just looking forward, like, how does the relationship between gold and Bitcoin, do you see that playing out? I mean, uh, do you think, is it a case of Bitcoin replacing gold? Because that, that's, that's going to be a hard one to, hmm. you think anyway, for, for if gold being so long in the fabric of humanity, really. Yeah, look, that is a big question, like you said. And, and the important thing to realize, I suppose, is there's a lot of nuance and changes in history with gold. It was never, like you said, gold was a form of money in the terms of it was metal coins. But there was other metals as well. And there was, you know, different quantities of gold and silver and other things. And then when the Bank of England and the central banks adopted it as the basis of the currency, that was a different form of gold. That was gold bullion. And then there was paper notes that were backed by gold. And that relationship between money and gold wasn't without problems either. It, it, it created stability in the, the currency or the, or the exchange rate of the currency, but it created volatility elsewhere in the economy in unemployment and prices to some degree, which is, is a point worth making. It wasn't like this perfect system. Yeah. It was, But what it did do is it allowed the free market to react to changes in international trade um, probably faster than what happens today. Today, central banks tried to cover over volatility with money. You couldn't do that with a gold standard. You had to deal with the volatility. And in some ways, the economy and the citizens of the economy had, had to adjust to, to, to things quicker. Um, so that's what Actually, gold you're did. right. There was, there was panics all the time, wasn't there? Every there was so panics, often. yeah. Yeah, uh, and so financial so panics, it's yeah. There was financial panics. There was bank crises because if you if you gave if you if you got defaulted on in a, with a loan, I mean, there was a famous crisis in eighteen ninety with the Barings Bank in England, which you may might recall was actually famous. Um, you remember the Barings crisis? Maybe I think it was in the nineties when that Nick Leeson trader yeah, um, yeah. went a bit crazy, in, <laughs> which is another story altogether. But there was a Barings Bank crisis in eighteen ninety where the, the they they lent Ar Argentina like three million pounds worth of gold, and that the Bank of Argentina defaulted on it, and there was panic in England at the time because the whole heap of their gold reserves are now gone. And the Bank of France and the Bank of Russia came to the rescue and, and let, let the Bank of England borrow some gold. So there was no, it, it's not saying the, the gold standard was this perfect system. It was a system that had panics and crises. But what it did do is it made sure the government stuck to a budget. It, 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 it made sure the money supply couldn't go out of control. And it made... Kept people about, honest. It kept people honest. And when the crisis has happened they were not as sharp as, uh, they were not as large as they are today. What we do today with the current system, which is fiat money, is we try to suppress volatility quickly. Think about the GFC or the COVID crisis. We print a whole heap of money in, into the system in the in the aim, which might be a laudable aim to stop the volatility hitting the economy and making people unemployed and, and other things like that and businesses going bust. Fine, that sounds great in theory, but you suppress the volatility there and it just builds up to the next crisis. And if you look at the history of fiat money over the last 50, 60 years, is every crisis gets bigger and bigger and bigger in magnitude. So you're not, solving the you're not you're not solving the crisis and and you know wiping it away and starting again you're just building up to the next time and the next time so so that's the sort of the the pros and cons to both approaches i suppose mm. they're not neither is a perfect system and what i think coming to your question i suppose with bitcoin and gold is bitcoin offers advantages over gold which i think means it takes over a lot of aspects to what gold has done historically it allows um uh, real-time auditability which you can't do with gold uh, allows anyone to buy it or store it and transmit it which you can't do easily with gold you can't do it but it's not easy to say take some gold bullion overseas with you or or, or cut off a part of a bitcoin and, and buy something overseas or send it to someone overseas um, and in the financial system that real-time audibility of bitcoin is, a, is an important aspect as well because it is on the blockchain you can see it you can prove you have the, the bitcoin you have with gold that's a harder thing to do it's in vaults no one really knows where it is who owns it things like that so i think bitcoin acts in a way that gold did historically in keeping the financial system more honest uh, and i think at this point in its evolution, it also has the potential to help countries deal with their burgeoning debt loads. Because Bitcoin is so small in value compared to, you know, 
bond markets and the current value of, of government debt. I think some countries, and this is probably what the point I was trying to make with what would Sir Isaac Newton do if he was alive today and he was master of the Royal Mint, what currency or what asset would he adopt? Well, I think if he had a Britain that was in you know massive debt and never-ending debt, perhaps he would think, well, maybe we buy this ultra-scarce digital asset that's just valued very low because over time, if that can grow faster than our debt, it will help us cover our debt over time. And I think that's an important aspect to Bitcoin over gold right now as well. Gold's a fairly mature asset, which doesn't, it has been on a, on a very good move this these past year, but Bitcoin is still a nascent asset with immense potential uh, upside in its valuation and in how um, actors in the economy use it. So I think that's probably how I think of it. That's probably a long rambling answer, but... No, 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 it's interesting. I was going to say though, yeah, I mean, you said like if, if Isaac, Newton, uh, Isaac Newton was around today, is it going to require for... for so you do actually talk about the concept of a Bitcoin standard. Um, now, we, we could, we've got one question on that in a second, but is it going to require someone like Isaac Newton that turns out he was experimenting with alchemy and all that sort of stuff, and then he became in charge of the mint itself? Is it going to require someone to to, to make... No, those no kind of I, don't, I don't think it takes one person. And I think well, what the point I was making today was you have Black, BlackRock have now said that Bitcoin is a legitimate part of people's investment portfolio, which is a step along that journey. But then elsewhere in the economy, you've got millions of individual people like me who have bought some Bitcoin and store it as a, a long-term asset to try and protect ourselves from debasement and, and constant currency, you know, the value of your money going down. You can buy less over time, as people realize these days, uh, whereas my Bitcoin holdings go up in value in terms of their purchasing power, you know, not every year, but over any two or three year period, it goes up. it's gone up quite a lot historically, at least, and I think it will continue to do so. Um but then you've got BlackRock doing that. Then you've got people like Michael Saylor of MicroStrategy who are putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet and have one of the best returns of all companies over the last uh, four years. So there's another use case. There's a company saying, well, hang on. There's no point in us having $500 million in the bank because over time that's just going to be worth less and less. They made a strategy four years ago to to put money into Bitcoin and uh, invest their treasury asset in that and they've actually pursued a very aggressive strategy of adding more bitcoin to their balance sheet every year and they're one of the best returning um companies in the s&p 500 over the last you know four years that done better than nvidia which would surprise many people and mm -hmm. they've done that by pursuing by taking that newtonian thought of saying well this is an asset that can't be created out of nothing it can't be it's got scarcity value and it, it does have properties which is what blackrock say in their slide as well it has properties of money that are useful and by pursuing that, MicroStrategy have created a lot of value for themselves. So that's a company thinking about that. Individuals like me and, and, and millions of other people are doing that. You're starting to get small countries like El Salvador doing that. You're starting to get cities like Lugano in, in Switzerland thinking about doing that. Um, you've got uh, the BNY Mellon, one of the biggest banks in uh, in America, now asked, now just recently been approved to put Bitcoin, hold Bitcoin on behalf of customers, which for a long time, the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Um, banking system was against. Now they're allowing that. So in my opinion, is they've sort of seen the value that Bitcoin can bring to various different actors, uh, and they're starting to allow it. But the economists and the politicians and the central banks will still try to control it as much as mm. they can. Because even if you look at the history of gold, they still tried to control gold as much as they could when that existed. And they'll probably try and do the same with Bitcoin. I don't think that diminishes the value proposition uh, of Bitcoin. Um, and I, to a degree, I don't think they'll be able to control Bitcoin as much as they can control gold because Bitcoin exists in a, in a digital form. Anyone with a smartphone or a computer around the world can hold it and transact on it without anyone being able to stop it. So it's got that real um, ability to m transact freely with that gold never really had in modern times. Um, so I think you are not seeing one Isaac Newton, but you're seeing a bunch of people having that realization over time yeah. that this is viable and adopting it. And I think that will build into a crescendo over time, the time scale of that, who knows. But I think yeah. there is there is game theory. We've talked about this before. There's game theory. If I adopt something first and it does go up in value, you're going to be at a, a disadvantage if you take too long to adopt it as well, If if, if more and more people start to adopt it. I'm gonna just say so just a little thought experiment there. You you said a bit of game theory, but what what it just imagine, um, 
that that was going to happen like imminently or relatively soon. What what key challenges would you foresee in transitioning to such a system, and how might that affect current global economic dynamics? Because I mean. You've got right now, you've got certain countries, the BRICS, trying to escape the dollar system and they're naturally um, they're naturally going to gold, aren't they, to transact separately outside of things. Because they've seen what happens if you cross the states, the United States, right? They they, they punish you. with, So they don't want to be inside the dollar system. So I, I just wondered what you thought that any challenges to going to a Bitcoin standard would be to those global economic challenges or dynamics oh look the, the, it Big won't happen sorry. that kind of thing's not going to happen overnight it could take decades to occur if we're talking about moving purely off a dollar fiat standard to a bitcoin standard fully that is a long transition because like you said people are wedded to the dollar system and the higher up the power structures you go the more wedded they are to the dollar but what what i was trying to say before is you'll see that transition taking place on a wider scale and Bitcoin is not one thing. People use it in different ways. A bank might use it to shore up its balance sheet. A company might use it to stop itself from the value of its currency going down. Uh, an individual might use it to uh, flee a tyrannical regime and keep their wealth with them. You know, there's there's different use cases to Bitcoin. And I think we're already seeing some of those use cases playing out. But moving to a full Bitcoin standard is a different beast. As I was saying previously with the gold standard, it does introduce new uh, volatility elsewhere in the system. You, the democratic system has probably, to a degree, enabled the fiat system because people tend to vote away volatility. You know, if house prices come down in Australia, people will vote for the politician that says they'll they'll stop that, um, or, or they have historically. And if that means increasing the money supply, the average partner doesn't really care about that. You know, they, they just want yeah. their, their house prices to stay up. Um, but over time that's bad because there's a whole generation of people that can't buy a house and then they might vote for a different system and, and, and the fiat money system is relatively manipulated that way to allow, you know, probably the majority to vote for where the money goes and how the money is created and how it's spent. And you even have theories like modern monetary the theory with, I think, Stephanie Kelton, who goes out there proposing it, which is like everyone just gets a fixed amount of money given to mm. them every month and, and, you know, they don't need to work for it. That doesn't make sense in in the normal world, but in the fiat mind, that makes sense, you know. <laughs> so 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 I think where Bitcoin comes in, it comes a, it, it, right now. It stands as a bulwark to those systems, and I think those systems are proving their fragility right now. It takes time, but um, you can see in the price of goods and services going up massively over the last four years. Uh, you can see the currency debasement. Um, you can see. Um, even the control that uh, governments are trying to exert over individuals' fi financial transactions or even businesses. I, I read a story this morning that said a, a judge in America had ordered Starbucks to reopen um, to to outlets that they'd shut because they said they didn't shut them down. F they shut them down for anti-union reasons. So that, that's a judge. That's a court <laughs> ordering a private business to reopen two stores that wants to shut down. This is the stage of capitalism or the, the yeah. stage of the yeah. system we're in now. We're in, which is like. It's thrown up all these weird scenarios that, and people are looking at it going, well, that's not how I thought the free market worked. And I think that's where they start to look at alternate systems again and they, they look at Bitcoin. And over time, there'll be that transition. And what Bitcoin eventually does is the same as what gold did. It keeps uh, the system honest. It keeps the government and, and the economists and the money printing honest to a degree. It doesn't get rid of volatility, but it allows... It allows uh, actors to be responsible for their decisions and adjustments to be made f faster. Look, if I, if I lend you my Bitcoin because you've got a great business idea and you never give me it back, then we both took a risk and I'll lose my Bitcoin. You know, that's the way it should be. In the current system, banks can get bailed out after the GFC after making trillions of dollars of loans and no one gets fired and 12 months later, a bank CEO gets a $100 million bonus. You know, like that's that's the system we live in now um, and that's, that's the system I think that is on its last legs in some degree. Um, and I think over time, the, the the feature of independent hard money, which is why Newton chose gold in the first place, because who's going to trust yeah. the British pound if it's not independent? Um, I think that's where people and different um, actors in the economy start to see the benefit of Bitcoin, because you don't need to trust anyone. You, you can just trust that they have the Bitcoin they say they do, and you can verify mm -hmm. it. So that makes the world a bit different. It doesn't make it 
a utopia <laughs> and it doesn't get rid of volatility. Well, I think one thing we can establish is utopias just don't exist. I'll, I'll, just one final question for you, Ryan, considering the whole conversation. Given the comparison between gold and Bitcoin as stores of value, how would you advise investors? So I know it's quite interesting to have do a thought experiment. What would happen on a Bitcoin standard? All this, I mean, yeah. even a gold standard coming back is unlikely across the, because it, it's not in the favor of, of of the people that run run the show. But but yeah. taking it back to the investors level, how would you advise them to balance portfolios between these two assets in the in the current climate, economic yeah. climate? That's a good question, and it's a crucial question. And and this goes for any asset. No asset is an all or nothing proposition. You know, you might love AI stocks, but you're not going to put all your money in AI stocks. You might like uh, gold stocks, but you're not going to put all your money in gold stocks. The, um, you might not like an asset, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't have some in it either. That's the other crucial thing. And and that goes for, for Bitcoin. I think the way you have to think about it is a part of your portfolio, and it's a unique part of your portfolio. It does things that other parts of your portfolio can't. It's got properties that other parts of your portfolio don't. And crucially, it exists in a different financial system it, it exists in this parallel system which uh, has this fixed supply of bitcoin it's open to anyone anywhere in the world 24 7 it'd be transmitted freely it can't be printed by the fed or the central banks so it has these properties you've got this portfolio of assets as an investor you've got real estate shares uh, bonds money in the bank in my opinion, you need to think, well, what portion of my portfolio should be in Bitcoin? And look, that's the way, I've said that for years, but that's the way BlackRock are pitching it now. They're adding it to their standard portfolios um, because in their words, and this is the sort of technical term, they see it as a as a non-correlated asset. They see it as an mm -hmm. asset that, you know, at times it's correlated with the stock market, but at other times it's it does its own thing. You know, it, it goes off on its own trajectory. And when it does th that in those times, it tends to, when it makes these moves up, they tend to be very short and sharp. So you can't, you can't wait necessarily to say, oh, if it starts to get traction, I'll jump on. Because the history of Bitcoin is the moves up can be very, very sharp when they happen. They can be short and sharp. And also, so when the moves, when the up moves happen, everyone's trying to transfer money into their Bitcoin. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, and and the scarcity value of Bitcoin is such that it's not easy to get when everyone wants it. So it's the kind of thing you need to think about. And this goes with your portfolio in general. Think about it in, van, in advance. How much of my portfolio am I willing to have in this asset, given that it is volatile, but it has immense upside. It's on the early stages of what I think is is is, is, er, is trajectory, um, and it plays a function that no other part of your portfolio does. Uh, Greg Foss, a Canadian bond trader uh, veteran, calls it um, fiat insurance. That's how he thinks of it. He thinks of it as an insurance policy to the rest of his portfolio. Uh, Michael Saylor, on the other hand, views it more as digital property. He he says, "Look, this is like New York land, you know." 250 years ago they're not creating any more of it and you can buy some of it today it's digital property it's it's a store of value asset that's that which is why people buy property let's face it people buy miami beachfront property or sydney property as a store of value don't they they don't buy it as a, just a place to live it has there's only so many function. blocks on that Cor in that area yeah correct exactly and that's bitcoin is the same it's a digital store of value and, and as i said before the game theory that is how more and more people are starting to see it so right now it's trading about you know 62,000 almost 63,000 US dollars. It's about 1/15th the market cap of gold. It's a blip in the ocean of the, you know, financial assets in the world. Uh, and yet you've got projections from the likes of um Sailor and Van Eck and other uh, other financial institutions these days saying, you know, over the next 20 years it could be, you know, anywhere between 2 million and 50 million per bitcoin in terms of its fiat value. That's their projections, not mine. So that's the way you think about it. You think, well, this asset, I might not understand it completely because it is a thing that you need to you know, study quite intensively to really understand how it works and, and what it does. But you can understand theoretically the idea of digital scarcity. You can understand that what gold does and what it used to do in the economy. And you can understand the basics of supply and demand. When something is limited in supply and more and more demand is coming in for it for a variety of different reasons, then the price has to rise. So that's my thesis anyway. Uh, and my advice is for people to at least get interested in it and at least try and think about it as part of their portfolio. Uh, not not an all or nothing affair. I could be wrong, but if you've got 1% of it in your portfolio and I'm wrong about this, um, it's unlikely to cause you too much damage if you've got 1% mm. of your portfolio in it. If I'm right, that 1% uh, could grow to a much larger amount over time and protect yourself from a world, which let's face it, where the value of your dollar is going down every year. It can yeah. buy less and less. 
So that's the that's the role I see it as having in the investment portfolio. On a fundamental basis, I see it as having a role in changing the financial system. But that's, as we mm. said, that's a bigger topic and that's going to be a more long-lasting topic. But just because that is a, a very interesting but uncertain topic doesn't mean the investment proposition right now is not a bit more certain. Mm. Fascinating stuff, Ryan. I think we'll hold it there. I could go on for a long time. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> We, well, you, you have actually got a, a new presentation out. It's called the Bitcoin Investors Launchpad. And the idea of that is to really just help people get into... So, so if, you're, if you're sold on the idea that you want to make it part of your portfolio, how do you go about doing it? How do you go about doing it safely? Um, I'm not, not saying the asset class it is a safe, it's volatile, of course, but there's practical steps to take to store it safely and all that kind of thing. Anyway, we break that down for people. If you'd like to... Check that out. There's um, uh, there'll, there'll be links in the article that Ryan originally wrote today, which you can find on our website, and there's a direct link to that below. So, Ryan, thanks so much, mate. Much appreciate your time, and we'll see you again very soon. And thank you for tuning in. Cheers. Cheers.